And what we're going to do for the rest of the day, starting with Dr. De La Tour, is to talk about how do we do rehabilitation and how do we manage the symptoms that result from the various disorders that we've been talking about. And Dr. De La Tour will start us off. Thanks, everybody. Um, I wish I could have said this just before Dr. Greenberg went out the door. Uh, there are many things I'm grateful for, but one of them is to Chitra for positioning Dr. Greenberg's talk right before mine. Uh, he thinks I was being gracious to let him have some of my time. I wasn't. I, it, he's done some of my work for me. He's done approximately half of my work for me. Uh, the other thank you is to those of you who took part in the workshop uh, yesterday afternoon. I, I just, uh, it was just wonderful, and you're all, all of those who volunteered were such good sports. Uh, um, thanks so much. Let's see, how do I make this work? Just push that forward thing, and that'll do it. Will it? Oh, fantastic. I love that high tech. <laughs> All right. Uh, in a way, what we're going to do is codify what many of you, maybe all of you, are already doing, whether you are persons living with the uh, conditions mentioned, uh, personal caregivers, professionals. Uh, you're already doing most of this. So we're, we're just putting it into a a formula. Now, the principles, uh, one can identify an overarching goal, an interweaving principle, at least six strategies, and numerous, numerous tactics. All right. The goal, the, the restoration of optimal function and quality of life. That's what it's about. Um, and uh, I would say uh, there are some potentially conflicting aspects to that goal. And uh, I don't expect this from this group, but uh, and I departed from the prepared text last year in giving a, in Italy a talk on Parkinson's. And I have uh, at least one good friend with uh, Parkinson disease. And I talked about the conflict, particularly for people residing in an institution, between autonomy and safety. And I said the institutions tend to come down on the side of safety because I think they're protecting their uh, legal heinies uh, against lawsuits. And some will do so to the point that they uh, almost prevent autonomy. And so when I said I would personally come down on the side of autonomy, they gave me a standing ovation. I, maybe they were just tired from sitting so long. But anyway, I don't expect you to do that. Now, Dr. Greenberg has just said that no two people are alike. And that's true. But there is one principle that should be woven throughout all of rehabilitation, and that is anticipatory management. You don't have to be constantly hitting upside the head with surprises. Why didn't somebody tell me that you could get pressure sores? Why didn't somebody tell me you could get DVT? Why didn't somebody tell me you could get contractures? Uh, there are patterns, and, and so we don't have to be constantly surprised. Uh, so the strategies. Now, whether you're a lumper or a splitter, uh, you can at least identify six or seven. As some, if you're a splitter, you can make it more. Now, primary prevention. The term that uh, Dr. Greenberg said was uh, avoid the trigger. There is something, I, I'm giving a talk in Italy uh, this September on uh, rehabilitation of traumatic brain injury. Uh, I got a pretty good scam going there uh, that uh, once a year I get a free all expense trip to Italy if I can just come up with a talk that's reasonably in line with their theme of this year. Uh, 
it's relatively easy to prevent a traumatic brain injury. Uh, if you can prevent MS, uh, do tell us how, because you'll win the Nobel Prize. Uh, people don't usually think of primary prevention uh, as a rehabilitation strategy. It's implied. It's not usually stated. But I would submit to you that if uh, Enders, Weller, and Robbins and at least one other person at Johns Hopkins had not decades ago done the virology necessary for Salk and Sabin to come up with polio vaccines, then those of us in rehab would be looking at not shiny new iron lungs uh, at our meetings instead of just not getting the polio in the first place. Second one is reduction of the pathology to a minimum. That's usually implied as far as a rehabilitative strategy and not stated, but it's very much rehabilitation. Now, I want to submit that uh, in the early decades of rehab, uh, the wrong model was adopted. I don't think it was adopted by patients or specialists, but the rest of medicine came to think of, okay, here's a block of time called acute care, and then a block of time called rehab. wrong uh, I would submit that they're more likely matching inverted wedges so that there's an itty bit of rehab going on early and there's an itty bit of the acute uh, care even going on for uh, relatively long periods of time. So what did he say? Anti-inflammatories, neuroprotective mechanisms, and then he gave you uh, some of the tactics. That was just an absolutely brilliant talk. I think everybody recognized that. And getting down to comparing uh, a differential between the Asia A and non-Asia A and how they respond differently uh, on changes in the Kurtzky, uh, expanded Kurtzky scale. That, that one slide was worth whatever distance you had to come. It was brilliant. Now, this is a big one. Uh, this is usually the first of the explicitly stated rehabilitation uh, strategies, prevention of secondary disability or secondary complications. Um, and those you all know because some of you have seen the complications, pressure sores, contractures, uh, spasticity. Can you completely prevent it? Or should treatment of spasticity come under the heading of removal of a barrier? Uh, that's, that's another one. It's actually a strategy that goes throughout. Enhancement of the function of the affected systems. Um, I just looked over the shoulder of a colleague here at the far left and saw, you know, bladder management. Uh, there are all sorts of ways. So when you strengthen a muscle, someone asked me this morning, uh, she said she had uh, myopathy related from the statin drugs. And I see patients with that. And so she was asking me, how do I go about this, strengthening these, these muscles? Do I need to do it the rest of my life? Uh, she didn't ask, but I told her anyway, there are some precautions. So that if you, and I would tell it to all of you, as you attempt to enhance the function of the affected system, you also prevent a secondary complication. What am I talking about? For example, avoiding overwork weakness. Overwork weakness uh, is a concept that was uh, developed uh, in the management of polio. The original study in which it was reported was a lousy study that probably couldn't get published today, but it's enough to make our, uh, us be on our guard. Uh, do not push a, a muscle that you're trying to strengthen. Do not push it to uh, fatigue or temporary failure. This is the opposite of what we're doing if we're trying to uh, train Olympic athletes. We're always pushing them to their limits. Okay. 
enhancement of the function of the unaffected systems, that kind of overlaps with the compensatory strategies. That's why I say if you're a lumper or a splitter. Uh, so if, if you have uh, a, a condition that would be called an Asia A, complete, below, complete loss of motor and sensory function below the level of the lesion, we would be working on greatly strengthening the upper limbs. Uh, with traumatic spinal cord injury, we used to say you should have sufficient strength that you could handle your whole body weight relatively easy with one upper limb. Okay, so that would be an example of a compensatory strategy. Um, uh, just for illustration, jump to stroke. Uh, people who have had a single insult, a single stroke, usually have the opposite hemisphere that's nearly normal. So that if you would have a condition, say, of the right parietal lobe that gives you trouble uh, negotiating uh, in time and space, use the verbal strategies. I mean, people without any condition uh, learn to do that. At, at Sun Valley, Idaho, they're famous for teaching your body to ski. You leave your body there for a week and they teach it to ski. And uh, they have all these Austrian and Swiss ski instructors. And, and so uh, one of the Austrians said that he uh, overheard one of his students practicing turns and saying, hop down und lauf it. Hop down und lauf it. So he's using verbal strategies. In this case, he was using an Austrian accent because that's what he heard. Uh, so use the, the good the, or the relatively intact systems to compensate for some of the problems. Now, application of technology, it doesn't have to be high tech. Uh, the, the talk that you just heard was absolutely brilliant, you know, molecular technology. But yesterday we worked on some somewhat lower techniques, uh, but applying good biomechanical principles. Maybe some of you saw Mark and me uh, take a brace. Maybe it was a, a material that we weren't too familiar with. What did we do with it? We compressed it one way and another, and we twisted it so that we knew we could predict something about the biomechanical effects, even if we didn't know what the material was. So learning the, the principles of biomechanics and applying it, especially to problems of mobility. Uh, behavioral techniques. Uh, and really, in this case, that's, that's more learning theory. Um, I'm going to stick around for Dr. Wegner's talk, and uh, I don't know how much of this he will use. But uh, where there are problems of mobility, sometimes problems of pain that are hand, uh, stuck a long time, that, with, that you're stuck with a long time, uh, helping your body adapt very, very slowly. So a certain exercise, progressive aerobic a technique that I use in many of my patients with pain and mobility problems uh, what I do is base the progression, the quota of progression, on a baseline. So I stack the deck in the patient's favor. And I, as I tell them about it in advance, I say, I think you could probably use a break, right? Nobody ever says, no, no, I don't need any breaks. Uh, and, and allow the patient to adapt. Uh, don't think of behavior and physical things as totally distinct. You know, Descartes did us a great disservice by the notion that the mind was one thing and the body was another thing and the robot at the controls. They work together. How am I doing for time? Okay. Uh, then modifications of the built and social environment. Uh, we help the patient improve his or her function as much as we can uh, and then Again, give them a break. Modify the built environment. Um, I'll tell you, you don't want to get a mobility problem in uh, continental Europe. Uh, <laughs> you know, things that we now take for granted. 
universal engineering. And I will go in some doors, and I'm always carrying more junk than I should. And so I've got my hands. Besides that, I'll have a latte in one hand and all of this other stuff. I'm going to go in. Here's a, a plate with a little handicap universal sign on it. I hit it with my elbow. Okay? So don't think of some things are for people with disabilities, but not for the rest of us. So those... Um, and then the tactics, as I said, are, are, are legion. Um, I don't know how uh, to, to do this uh, particular strategy for uh, TM, but we've alluded to some of the tactics as we've gone along. So it is 10 straight up, so I'm going to stop now so Dr. Wagner can do his. I don't know. Is there time for one question? was either clear or impossibly muddled. So anyway, thanks for your attention. Thank you.